cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Tom, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate you My taking pleasure. the time. Yeah. Uh, wow, it got cold out there quick. It did. I'm... I just kind of got used to the idea of fall. Yeah. But then like 30 some odd degree temperatures, I'm like, ugh, I don't I, like this. I'll take it with the sunshine though. I will definitely take that. I it's mean. It's better than the alternative, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, harvest. Yes. It's kind of wrapping up and yeah. How was it for you? It was great. It was fast and furious this year. So we picked everything in four days. Wow. Uh, so that was about the fastest I've ever you know, moved. It's an interesting thing. Someone asked me during harvest, do I like it this way? And it's interesting because it's the first time where I feel like I've really gotten to compartmentalize every step of the process where it's like primary fermentation, you know, dealing with all of that in one go, you know, pressing things all in one go, barreling down all in one go. And so it lets your brain kind of do things very sequentially, which is really cool. Right. But the alternative is that you have to have those moments where you take a beat and you're like, let's slow it down for a second. Let's, you know, taste things. Let's really try to connect with these things because right now we're looking at, you know, 10 tons of fruit that just showed up. And that's a lot for a small producer like me. That's a third of the production. Right. You know, and to do that, you know, in a day was, was really, um, it was cool. You know, it was, wow. but it was, it was fast and furious. So qualitatively though, you know, I think I'm, I'm really excited about the diversity and dimensionality in the cellar. So it was, uh, I want to say we had about eight different varietals this year. So every year we're kind of in that, that kind of realm, but just seeing, you know, the flavor development so early on in all of these wines is really exciting. So I very can, hopeful. I yeah. can imagine. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Shall I pour us a little bit of a blind wine? Please. Yeah. Okay. As, as always, I tell everybody, whatever you want to say, mm-hmm. it's totally up to you. Okay. Um, I always try to find something that might, you know, have a connection, might be something that you like, uh, you know, and, you know, again, whatever you want to say, it is sure. completely up to you. Cool. We, do we jump right in on that? Or? Yeah, go ahead and jump right. in and Let's see what we got here. Yeah. You know, it was... Uh, it was funny. I blinded uh, Andrew from Audeant on mm-hmm. one of your wines, and that was just—it was so fun to hear yeah. his reaction. Yeah, he's a he's a good pal, and and I think a very talented winemaker. So to have him speak positively, or at least you know, crack a smile when he's he's tasting <laughs> through something that you make is always a kind of a fun moment. But um, that's interesting. I'm gonna unpack this for a little while. I have ideas already. Okay. Um, but I'm gonna try to. Um, you know, when you're blind tasting, you're always like, sometimes one of the pitfalls is that you try to play the player versus play the wine. And so understanding that there might be some semblance of a connection on this one, my brain's already like firing on those synapses, but right. I just want to take it at face value. So yeah. we'll kind of kind of look at it over the next uh, couple of minutes, if that's all right. Oh, of course, of cool. course, of course. Uh, earliest memories, you know, you're out, you know, with your grandfather making yeah. wine in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. on Oregon Avenue. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. It is. Um, it's one of those like cool life moments where you start to connect some of those dots. And I don't know if it's like self-fulfilling prophecy or not, but um, it was such a neat experience to grow up in that environment and to feel like that was the norm, you know, to see the community building and the camaraderie around that, just the level of connection that I got to have with my grandfather around it all was so special. And it's, you know, I uh, he passed uh, about 15, 16 years ago now, so he never really got to see me in this realm or have you know one of one of my wines but you know it certainly informs my love and joy of this whole thing you know right. so it's you know stylistically it's interesting i mean i can vaguely recall some of the wines you know he really liked to work with merlot which i thought was funny he called right. it merlot because <laughs> you know he uh his uh he learned english here in the states but it's funny that now I make Merlot in my own cellar, which is kind of a cool that thing. Cool. And, and I, um, what's really neat about it all, and I've been toying around with this idea for a little while, but 
I, my family still has some of the wines that he made oh, and, wow. um, you know, they're still in like, uh, you know, kind of one gallon jugs and stuff like that. And an idea that kind of crossed my mind was to see if I could take that wine and in the future blend it with a wine that I make, mm. um, and just see if there's something, something there, you know, just yeah. kind of the, the collaboration that took, you know, 20 years to come together or yeah. something like that. That would but, be amazing. Yeah. I mean, we'll see, you know, so I, I actually checked in on it, uh, two years ago, I was home for the holidays back in Philadelphia and we pulled, uh, pulled a cork on a bottle and surprisingly, you know, it was like, it was still like very approachable. It certainly had, you know, development to it. Don't get me wrong, but you know, it had the pieces. And I think in that moment I was like, okay, I think I could work around this and build something that, you know, allows us to have something that will continue to, to age, you know, and, and kind of push the, the finish line on that wine down, you know, yeah. much further down the road. So yeah, most definitely. And what yeah. I really liked about, you know, the re your grandfather didn't make wine to like sell it. Yeah. Like it was house wine for sure. Yeah. And it was house, like truly like my concept of wine. And I think even his, to a certain point was like, there was like his wine was the wine like that was it you know right. he wasn't going to go shop for wine or anything like right, that right, right. i think it was that like old world mentality too that was kind of fun it, it is it yeah. is fun i was over in italy and croatia yeah. you know this year sure and you know that whole mentality of like oh there's a yard and it has vines in yeah it, and it's for the house wine yeah i i just adore that yeah it's kind of a cool thing to think about like i like the idea of just it makes it feel a little more like sustenance versus just like just alcohol you know it's like it gives it this you know kind of meaning and, and not to you know make it feel you know more important than it is but it's like it is it is so special when you have those connections like that where you realize it's not commoditized it's about the people who are part of the process and, exactly. you know i always joke that like if you know i i locked the door tomorrow and and said hey i'm done making pray tell wines at least i have a lot of wine that i'd be happy <laughs> drinking you know right and and that's kind of i think why you know this whole thing feels special to me is that I'm making wines that I enjoy making, like want to drink and right. hopefully find like-minded people that, you know, share those sensibilities or at least like a style of wine making basically. So, yeah. 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 And, and your sense of family, I, I, I have adored so many little pieces and parts of your story yeah, of, of you. family. Uh, so growing up in Pennsylvania, yeah. you know, you attended the Haverford school, Haverford school. Yeah. Haverford school, yeah. Sorry yeah. About that. And, um, uh, you know, so you had a couple teachers that uh, your dad, you know, also had, you yeah. know, they were the teachers for your dad as yeah. well. And what really got you was, you know, them pulling out some of your dad's artwork. Yeah. I mean, what was, I mean, I, I don't know. Were you proud at that moment? Were you embarrassed at that moment? I mean, I was, honestly, I was impressed that people can catalog something and keep it around for that long, you know? Right. And, and I think it also, again, I think just, you know, I, I really loved my time at that school just because it felt like there was this really lovely connection between, you know, teachers and students where it was more than just the transaction of you're here to learn this. You know, there was so much emphasis on, you know, just like being a good human and, and, and you know, all that kind of stuff and, and community and everything. And the fact that like people could really make a connection, like one of my art professors, the same art professor who had that right. remained a friend after me graduating. Uh, so, you know, I'd gone back, he's since passed, but um, you know, a couple years ago, I was back in Philadelphia, we met up for lunch and we actually met up with other local artists in the area. And just like, it was so cool to see the world through his eyes and, and just see that like, I could remain like, they saw in their students, you know, they were trying to cultivate this sense of whatever it was, if it was writing or artistry or whatever, and they wanted to actually see that through beyond just, you know, your time in their classroom. Right. And to have that with, um, with my dad's art, you know, and, and all that, it just, it was, it was this like woodblock thing that was really neat. And I was like, I was like, wow, it, it just showed a level of care that I think, you know, was, was so surprising. So yeah, it I meant can, a lot. I yeah. Can, I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, well, you have some wines here for us I do, today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shall we dive into one? Happy to. We okay. can start kind of on the on the front end, or if you kind of want something that you know you can kind of slowly sip on too, we can we can jump through. But I've got kind of a smattering of three different vintages of things. Is that right? Maybe four different vintages actually. Um, but we could start with with some Pinot Gamay here if you like. Yeah, so that would be great. This is 60% um, uh, Gamay from okay. some pretty young vines, and then 40% Pinot Noir from a site that's a little further established down in the Yola Amity Hills. So I, is it, how, 
how, how do I put this? Gamay and Pinot Noir blend. Mm-hmm. That's not pretty typical. I mean, that's not typical, is it? It's so something that prior to really getting into um, wine making, just being a, a wine you know appreciator and drinker, and, and really you know I always joke that's when you're on the best side of it. Is right, you get to be the consumer of the of the thing. Right. Um, it's uh, it's something that uh, the Pass du Grand. Uh, AOC in France is is where they allow that blend to happen. So it's kind of Burgundian adjacent okay. um, and, and basically kind of, I think, throttles the line between Burgundy and Beaujolais. And typically, a lot of the times, it's stuff that's kind of declassified from bigger houses that are making, you know, some of the higher end Pinots or, or focusing on Gamay. And it was really meant, I think, as kind of a fun table wine for the community there. Right. Um, so usually a little more approachable from a price point, but I always thought that there was magic in those blends. And I thought that there's this really lovely kind of synergy and, and also tension between the two that makes for this vibrancy that's so young and fresh and, and kind of just celebratory as a wine. And so um, I started making this blend, and it's changed every year in terms of percentages and all that, but doing a, a Gamay Pinot blend back in 2018. And the label, so I should mention, I do all the labels myself. I cut everything out of paper. But the label inspiration for this particular wine uh, was growing up as a little kid and trying to capture fireflies in lanterns. Mm, and I always thought, like, right. wow, it felt like magic in a in a in a uh, in a jar. And so I was thinking about lanterns and trying to capture that magic. And so every year I've changed what's on the inside of the lantern. Mm. But the kind of Easter egg with this label is that if you put multiple bottles next to each other, it looks like string lights. And so this to me is always like such a fun, you know, like table wine for um you know summer gatherings and all that yeah, kind of stuff yeah, but no, had a cool energy to it but yeah yeah and i i am thoroughly enjoying the wine yeah thanks. it's um well how do i oh when i'm all when i'm put on the spot about talking about a wine i'm always kind of at a loss for words yeah you're blind tasting me on camera and microphone i love it <laughs> <laughs> um but it sometimes Gamay is this little bit of kind of hits you in the face. It's yeah. like big. It's not big as in like a cab. Sure. But it's very fruity. Yeah. It's very up front. And this is nice mm-hmm. to me. In my preference, I like the, the calmness sure. of this yeah. and be able to enjoy this, you know, through and through. Yeah, it's a wine that, um, I mean, I agree with you. Gamay can be a little exuberant as a young wine. And I think kind of, finding the nuance there is always is always fun i mean you know you think about the caricature version of it with beaujolais nouveau for example where it's all carbonic maceration it's all this amplification of fruit it's pretty primary you know you look at that and then you also look at you know other examples on the opposite end of the spectrum with like cru beaujolais that are just like super refined really beautiful and and kind of like laser focused and i think they they certainly hold their own against you know some of their you know kind of counterparts in burgundy even at, right. you know, typically a more approachable price point. But I think that, um, you know, it's it's a varietal that kind of takes some um, some interesting handling to, to figure out, you know, where the nuance is going to be with that. Right. But stylistically, I'd say that that's kind of the, you know, theme across the board is trying to find that nuance and a little more elegance or prettiness. That's always the goal. I mean, my, my thing is like the best compliment that I could typically kind of hear about pouring the wines for someone who's never had them is that they kind of find this through line of prettiness across all of them. Right. And so that's, um, you know, I'm glad that you can kind of feel that, that tamp down of energy here just enough to make it a little more elegant and kind of softer than, than just being super, uh, primary and, you know, right. Violent. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I, and yes, I do all of your wines that I've had over the years. I love the nuance. Thank you. Everything. That's I appreciate there. that. Oh, uh, so you kind of uh, got the wine bug a little bit at Harvest at uh, Brooklyn Winery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and after after Harvest with that, you're like, I need more. Yeah. So you went uh, two uh, two months intensive yeah. with the Court Master Sommelier. Yeah, that was that was like you know glutton for punishment basically. You know, <laughs> I worked the the graveyard shift for Brooklyn Winery while I was a book editor still. And so I kept my day job from nine to five and then I'd work 5.30 PM until about 4 AM at the winery in, in Brooklyn. Um, and I did that for two months. And, um, and then after that, that winter I had enrolled in this intensive sommelier program that met, 
uh, I want to say it was actually closer to like six months because I had fin- finished it in the spring, um, but it was three nights a week and it was four hours every night. So it was two hours of blind tasting, eight to 10 different wines. And every class was taught by a, a master sommelier right. through the court. And then the other two hours were all theory. So it was just studying, you know, the things that you just kind of made those associations with in terms of terroir and flavor profiles and all that stuff. And it was you know, classic wines, classic regions, you know, classic producers, kind of that's how you kind of build those those markers for blind tasting. Um, but yeah, the other two hours was just kind of learning the theory behind all of that. And it's all just what you realize is that it's just, it's deductive reasoning, you know, when you're blind tasting. And so um, it opened my eyes to the world of wine. Because again, up until that point, you know, my familiarity with wine was largely familial, just in terms of what was coming from my grandfather's cellar. Right. Or it was through the wines that my dad was really interested in at the time. And, and his taste in wines has since kind of evolved and shifted as well. I mean, my on- onboarding with wines was kind of the classic route. It was a lot of California wines, a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon and kind of heartier reds from there. And, um, and that was a great, you know, those are friendly wines to come on board with, you know, they're, they're pretty juicy, they're big, they're friendly. And, and I think that that's, you know, I think when you kind of get into this thing, you continue to kind of you know, sharpen the blade and, and, and find your focus. And ironically, it's like you kind of get to a point where you're making things that feel so um, just kind of polished and lean and pretty. Like I said, you know, it's right. just like it's just feel, felt like over the years just to kind of keep trimming and trimming until you get to that focus point, which is, you know, polishing a diamond, I should say, is kind of a better better example there. But yeah, it's it's a cool onboarding, I, I would say. And, but, but that was certainly where, where it started for sure. So the the court, you know, and doing the Samoye stuff just started to show me, hey, there's, you know, 85 different versions of Chardonnay you could taste in a day. Right. You know, which one do you like, you know, or which one do you anticipate, you know, people are going to like in a dining, you know, environment or that kind of stuff. So it was, it was invaluable, truly. I, I can only yeah imagine how invaluable yeah. it was. But doing all those blind tastings mm-hmm. at, at some point, I mean, I've read books and memoirs, you know, people kind of, you know, doing all the tasting groups and sure. whatnot. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'm in over my head. Yeah. This is crazy. I mean, did you ever get to a point of like, what am I doing? You know, I think it was like, I think when you start to put in the moment, it feels really like it feels right there it's exactly what's in front of you and it's this transaction that's happening where you're like i'm trying to learn this thing that's right here in front of me i think where it started to feel a little more stressful was when the sense of urgency around the testing portion of that was coming into play where it's like okay you have to do this on the spot now and it's performative that performative element to it was was interesting because you know you're doing these things during the exam and it's like you're trying to open a bottle of champagne while you're also getting asked questions about you know other producers or recommendations for the meal and I think that whole thing you know I didn't come from a hospitality background you know I was editing psychology books at the same time that was my job and so to go into that where it felt like there was all of a sudden like this need to kind of you know polish things up and have presentation and and all that those mechanics while you're also you know talking about wines or recommendations that's where i started to feel like oh like this feels foreign to me this is like this new you know for someone who's seemingly relatively introverted you know sitting in a cubicle (laughs) editing psychology books by themselves all day to go into this you know theater now of performance was was a whole new thing where i felt a little bit like a fish out of water but you kind of find you know with all things with practice with all that i mean even just talking about my own wines it's like you know, the level of comfort that you have when you make something that you're so personally attached to, and then you have to go and share it with the world. It's like, I could, I got to a place where I could talk about other people's wines all day. And I was, you know, I was good at it. You know, I was doing uh, wine sales for other wineries out here and, and, uh, you know, import wines as well. But when it came time for me to start talking about my own wines, I was like, you know, I, I was a little nervous and I'll never forget the first time I ever showed a Pray Tell wine. It was, it was a Gamay. So I made I started this whole project with just 120 cases back in 2017. And I went and I I launched the brand for the first time to anyone at the I Love Gamay festivals when they used to put those on. And I'll never forget, I put the wine on the table and had people coming up to come taste. And, you know, within the first five minutes, somebody comes up to the table and they're like, they point at the label and they go, are those boobs? (laughs) And it immediately, like, I felt like all the tension that I had just like completely go away. Because at that point it was like, 
it doesn't have to be so precious you know like it's a reminder to have fun with this thing and right. you know now every year when i make a label i do a body part check where i send it out to friends and family i'm like does any part of this look anything like a human body part you know like <laughs> i need to be anatomy proof on these right and so that's kind of the 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 fun of of designing your own stuff and being so head down and in the moment with it but you know i think it's it's i've i've developed a lot more comfort around it as well too it's it's understanding that you want the wines to be divisive. You don't want them to pander and say, you know, you get 10 reactions from 10 people at a table to say, oh, it's fine. You know, I want, you know, hopefully more than half the table to love it. But, you know, you want people to really say, wow, I really love this wine or, oh, you know, it's not for me. Because then it makes me feel like, hey, I'm doing my job. I'm making something that elicits a reaction out right, of you and right. not just, oh, you're, you know, it's fine. You know, it's the table red, you know, that kind of thing. So, right. yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to have the, those reactions. For just, sure. Just come up. Yeah. Uh, shall we move on to the next wine? Sure. Yeah, okay. happy to. I've got a little uh, a little thing here, if you'd right. like. Thank you. I pulled something that I thought would be kind of fun and, and special to check in on, too. So, okay. current release Pinot Noir for me is uh, 2021. Um, but I, uh, I made... Well, I've made Pinot every year since 2018, but I had pulled the shiner, but I have the bottle on the uh, table there for you to see. But this okay. is a uh, 2019 Pinot Noir. Okay. Um, this was the one that was featured in um, Bon Appetit back in 2021. So it sold out pretty quickly from there. 100% um, Pinot all from the Chehalem Mountains. And... Um, kind of aged you know there's varying degrees of whole cluster every year with pinot just based on the ripeness in 2019 i destemmed everything so really kind of i think with the rains that came through this feels to me very classic oregonian in style in terms of pinot noir um but aged all in neutral oak for um about 14 months and um and this has been in bottle now i just have about two cases of this left and uh, i think it's showing really beautifully right now i wish i had more of it to yeah, to enjoy. The, the nose on this is quite spectacular. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Move this over here. Try not to slurp the wines on mic, you know, as I'm, okay. as I'm tasting. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to do. This, oh. uh, this label, too, by the way, so with the Pinot every year, uh, it's always been a, a a flower pot and, and, and a plant in there. And the idea here is that, you know, being from a major city, I've never had a particularly green thumb. And so I always joke that, you know, I thought keeping a house plant alive was as simple as just watering it every day. Turns out that's not the case. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, I, ironically, now I do have uh, two house plants that I've kept alive for multiple years now. So I'm rather proud of that. But I was thinking about um, Pinot Noir and just how much level of attention that it requires um, compared to other things. I just think it requires the most kind of like delicacy and, and just kind of nuance in terms of paying attention. You know, I check in on it the most. It's probably the thing that I will pull from barrel and taste the most regularly. Right. Just because I find that depending on the vessel or different periods of, of the wine's life during the maturation time, it just kind of requires you to, to be vigilant. You know, sometimes you're like, hey, it's starting to broaden a little too much in amphora. Let's move it to stainless steel or, you know, things like that. So um, so I thought, what better uh, symbol of that than having the house plan on there that requires you to be a little more vigilant, basically. So, um, so yeah. And every year I change the colors of, of the, you know, the, the planter and the leaves and stuff like that. But no, that, that is great. And, you know, like I said, the nose on this is great. Uh, sipping on this, uh, I, I I adore the heck out of it. Thank right? You. I mean, yeah. all, all of your wines I've really thoroughly enjoyed over the years, and this one, it has it has this nice weight to it, a nice mm -hmm. texture, and if you you said it was neutral, and it just yeah. it, it doesn't seem neutral to me. Yeah, it seems like there's a little more of that like kind of underlying baking spice, and I and I'm curious about that just in terms of you know Chehalem Mountains fruit, um, you know, and and even now I've been primarily just kind of like bouncing back and forth every year with with Pinot Noir from either the Chehalem Mountains or Eole Amity. Those tend to be the two that I, I mean I love Ribbon Ridge too. Don't get me wrong, but you know those seem to be the two. AVAs out here that I, I like the expressions of Pinot Noir, particularly from, you know, friends and peers in the industry. But um, I think that there's kind of this cool underlying, like, like blueberry, you know, kind of element to this wine as well. And, and, 
yeah that baking space is kind of interesting but yeah neutral wood yeah that's it, it is quite spectacular yeah, thank you i appreciate that yeah uh so i i did i was doing some more research as i kind of came up here my next question doesn't seem uh all that great right now so the you you uh came from pennsylvania decided mm-hmm. to do a road trip all the way out here to, to california yeah and then your other grandfather decided to come along with you yeah and he's like uh drive-in dives and diners drive-ins and dives yep. yes yes yeah uh, I know that you only went to one. Yep. <laughs> um, we, but we did not make Guy Fieri <laughs> proud on that trip. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Unfortunately, did you? So did you? Did y'all make up for it or something afterwards? I mean, oh, just doing different stuff. I mean, you know, we were. It's kind of a fun thing to do a road trip without a plan. I think that it's you know it's something that we'd start our days and we would just see where we would end up accordingly, and so to look at. Um, you know, a map and just be like, yeah, I think we're going to kind of shoot for here and we'll just stop along the way. Like we had some things that we knew we definitely wanted to do. Like we went to Graceland, we went to um, uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, I'm trying to think of like what other kind of big things. You went to the Jack Daniels we distillery. We the Jack Daniels distillery. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we were like, okay, we have our target points. But along the way, other than that, we just kind of, I think we're just like, looking things up while we were right. going. Um, and, and I think that that's a really fun way to just kind of like let the road take you where, you know, right. where it's going to go. And it's, it's, I actually just did that again this summer. Um, uh, my girlfriend and I, we did a, a road trip from, uh, here all the way out to Philly, uh, to see family. And it was kind of the same thing. And it's really like such a lovely way to just be like, Hey, we're going to get in the car and we're going to make stops along the way and just see, see what happens. Right. So, yeah, but he was, a, he was a trooper for it. We, uh, we kind of, we made it in six days and we ended up landing in Sonoma. And at the time my uncle was a chef out there, his son. Um, and so it was great cause we landed and immediately, you know, ate great meals and had wine waiting for us. And, yeah. kind of kick things off on the on the like wine journey on the west coast but yeah that that would be fun so one grandpa was into wine the other one sounds like he was into food very into food very into wine as well but um more of the like you know purchasing and and you know kind of consumption side versus the the production side of it okay but I think it's just, you know, there's there's obviously such a lovely connection between food and wine in general. I mean, I really think of wine as a food product. I mean, it feels, um, I feel like when I'm making wine, I feel like there's these cooking sensibilities that come in. And, and the metaphors that I typically like to use in terms of just like approach for wine is that some people make wine like baking and some people make wine like cooking. And so it's the baking side, obviously you're following a little more of a recipe. There's a little more kind of like just pragmatism there of like hey we have to hit these marks um whereas for you know the cooking side it feels a little more intuition based and there's like i don't know if reactive is the right word it's the word i used to use um but then it feels a little bit like you're you're kind of letting too much happen outside of your control um whereas there are proactive things that you could obviously do to ensure that you know fermentations are healthy with you know temperature management or just cleaning like crazy or making sure that you're basically inhibiting any bad you know things from happening to a ferment but um yeah food and wine i mean it's just it's it's like the way of life i i've i've been really fortunate to grow up in a in a big family that most people love to cook in and do really great jobs uh with that and i even love to cook myself and so it's just a um you know it's part of life i guess it it is part of life uh and before we started recording you were talking yeah about uh, ron at okta yeah have you been to okta yet i have i've um i've had the the pleasure of going there and it um it's a really lovely experience you know ron's doing some really great stuff with the wine program there and the hospitality is is you know immaculate and um it's such a neat space to see this connection between you know things that are being grown locally when it comes to both food and and you know, their meats that they're using, and then also just the emphasis on, you know, local wines as well. I mean, you're talking about a place that probably has, you know, unparalleled 
access to some really beautiful import wines. And yet, you know, the emphasis to not only have those as options for people, but to be able to do a food and wine pairing there where you're seeing things that are made locally kind of featured alongside, you know, he's, he's such an, an in tune, um, you know, wine curator for that place. And, and he's, um, yeah, he's, he's doing some great work, but it's a lovely experience there. It yeah. very much is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go into the next one? Happy to. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're getting into um, kind of a fun, so we spoke a little bit about the Pinot Merlot blend that I made previously. Right. This is kind of the spiritual successor to that one, and it's something that um, I think is a really fun blend, but I think it, it's kind of like when people ask about, you know, if I had to kind of sum up Pray Tell in, in a nutshell, just in terms of like what what is the kind of philosophy of this place? I think sometimes that a wine like this might do the trick. You know, if this were an elevator pitch, I think what it's going to show you is that the thing that is kind of paramount to the wines that are made in this building is there's a playfulness to them, um, but there's also the, the importance of the blending table. And I think that that's something that kind of speaks to previous, you know, producers that I've worked for, um, but also just kind of the, the fun of this place is, is not really coming in with any preconceived notions or like rules and instead just feeling like what's the best wine that we can make on the table and what is it? And, and, and so it'll be fun to, to see your thoughts on this one after having had the Pume before in the past. Yeah. The, um, I, I forget which one this is, but I think I saw it on your on your mailing list. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, that sounds really interesting." Yeah, it's a little different, you know. It's something that. Um, so this is uh, just so that folks can actually kind of get an idea of what's going on here. This is a blend of Pinot Noir, um, Syrah, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So the Pinot is from the Willamette Valley. The Syrah is from the Rocks District, which I absolutely adore for Syrah. And then the Cabernet Sauvignon is from Walla Walla. And so you've got three very different and distinct AVAs that I think are all handling each of their respective varietals really beautifully and, and you know, synonymous with those, those things. But these are all fermented separately. And the idea, you know, behind this um, started a couple of years ago when I was like, hey, there are certain varietals that feel like they've kind of gone into a little bit of a stale phase at least some of the stuff that i'd seen or or was tasting felt like very brown uh, categorically and and i mean that in a way that i blend my wines based on color like the way that i see things i'm sitting when i sit down and i taste through things i immediately start to associate colors with the flavor profiles that i'm having um, and I, I kind of alluded to that a little bit with like the shehalem and the blue fruit for the pinot noir um, that we previously had but it's something that i think just I, it just happens that way for me. That's the way my brain works, I guess. And so Merlot is a varietal that I absolutely love. We talked a little bit, I think, off mic about the connection to, you know, my grandfather making Merlot. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's a varietal that I'll continue to make. I have more in the cellar as we speak. Um, but this was kind of the next iteration of that. And I wanted to take three varietals again that you wouldn't think on paper necessarily are, you know, supposed to go together. And yet I think that there's a really fun element here that they actually kind of have this really beautiful like connection here, which is so cool. And I agree. And I'm still processing here, but I have two questions. So you said uh, the three varietals and they're feeling a little brown. Yeah. So what do you mean by brown? I haven't heard that well, term before. I think, I think for me, when I think about that brownness element, it's just like this like it's when a varietal feels like you've got a lot of extraction out of it, you've got a lot of power, but it's not like you're not getting the, the like tension that we look for in terms of like acidity and, and like that balance. Right. And, and, and I think the vibrancy element of color here, like you can see there's kind of this fun zippy element to this that, you know, it's like, it feels like it's not a straight line on a chart. It's kind of like this, this peaks and valleys while you're unpacking it. Right. Right. And so I, I'm kind of vacillating between like the blues and the reds here with this one and maybe in purple, like it's just kind of this ping okay, pong, okay, you know, okay, okay. and, and it's between the, the varietals. And, and I think it's trying to, when I think about the freshness and the vibrancy of each of those varietals, like they inherently want to give you something that is, that is more emphatic than Brown. But you think about like, I think of tiredness with Brown. A lot of times you think about aging a wine for a long time. 
oxidation is going to brown the wines just in color right and you're starting to get more of that development of kind of like you lose the freshness of it maybe sometimes you pick up some really beautiful secondary or tertiary characteristics that make for an absolutely lovely wine um, but sometimes they can just get a little fall into this camp where they just start to get a little tired a little muddy and so for me looking at that and saying hey i'd love to try my hand at this in a way that feels like we're gonna like pack it with with like loads of energy but like try to preserve this elegance and this tension and so the goal with the wine like this is to have loads of energy still have like you know that nice kind of acidity that's keeping it fresh but like shows you each of those varietals as well right I don't get the sense that any one of them are camping on the other two. Um, it's kind of cool when you start to look for them. You could see what they each contribute to a wine like this, which is really neat. But this was aged in a combination of neutral wood and also some terracotta as well. So in 2020, this is a 2022. Okay. Um, some of the Cabernet was in Amphora and some of the Syrah was in Amphora as well. And I think that they kind of add a really interesting element as well to the wines. Um, for flavor dimensionality, there's some really neat elements of like this dusty kind of old world earthenware kind of element um, right. when you're coming out of them exclusively. I like the way that they play with things aged in wood or even in stainless. I think that they just kind of add different layers of, of flavor, which is super fun. So, yeah, and you're, I loved your explanation of, you know, the, the peaks and the lows of this wine mm -hmm. because, you know, it does. It, it kind of, you know, slowly you know, comes in on your entry yeah. and it, it peaks in the, again and then yeah. it kind of comes down and then on the finish. It For is sure. Like, it's like, hello, hi yeah. there. And it's, I, I really enjoy that analogy. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, you know, I think obviously like, you know, the way that I think about things, even with, with the colors and brown, it may seem nonsensical to most people. It's just kind of the way that, you know, it's, it's trying to articulate a creative process and that's kind of my right. version of trying to simplify it down. But it's, it's, it's a it's a funny thing. The the best way I've kind of ever thought about it as a visual aid is um, if you've ever seen the movie Ratatouille. It's yeah, yeah, the Pixar yeah. one. So there's a scene in Ratatouille where um, Remy, the the kind of uh, little chef uh, mouse, is trying to describe to his cousin Emile like a flavor pairing of like a piece of cheese and a strawberry and he's describing it and he's like you know emil closes his eyes and he's like starting to see these little fireworks kind of you know the synapse is firing and you start to think about that and it's like that's the way that i kind of think about wines you know it's right, like right. when you're tasting and you're doing this and it's like i'm like thank goodness for pixar for at least having a <laughs> reference point that i could hopefully steer people towards but yeah um yeah i don't know it's it might be be goofy but that's the no, way it works for me it's, it's not goofy <laughs> at all no no yeah and i i'm still trying to find a way to describe this wine besides the the peaks and the valleys mm -hmm. it is it has you know as it comes into you it's yeah. it is that I guess I get more the the Pinot at first because mm -hmm. it's smooth and yeah. kind of elegant. And then it kind of starts to really open up and the yeah. Syrah and the Cab yeah. start to like high. Yeah. But it's not a, um, it's not like a punch you in the no, face yeah. at all. It's like this really interesting kind of crescendo almost, you know, where you're right. starting to kind of like have this build up. And I think that on the, the way that you've kind of put it just in terms of sequencing is interesting because I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're totally right. Like it starts with the Pinot. I feel like it kind of like moves into as it's kind of going up the hill into Syrah and then the finish feels very like Cabernet to me a little bit. Yes. Um, but very kind of like well-integrated tannins. It's light on the palate, which I kind of like about it. But yeah. that's just, again, like we could talk about this more with the Syrah, but like just mitigating varietals that want to give you all this power to try to find that grace with them and that's that's something that is kind of the the goal with working with a lot of heavier reds i mean this year i brought in a little bit of malbec and wow. my goodness i like that thing should have you know come with like it was like a wrecking ball <laughs> truly like i i had maybe a couple hours of skin contact on it if that and it was coming out basically like full-on red wine wow and so just to see it, it's the first wine that's completely done in the building. Like it's through ML at this point. Like if I wanted to release it tomorrow, I'm like, oh, it's Malbec, you know, but I'm right. like, I've not drank a lot of Malbec, you know, it's, Neither. it's something, you know, Spanish, you know, examples of, or sometimes blended in Bordeaux. It's one thing, but like to just try it purely on its own at this stage is such an interesting learning curve. And it's why I continue to try to change, you know, I have the hallmark varietals I want to make every year. They're the things that I hope to continue to get better and better with, but it's why every year I also bring in new things because 
sometimes when you get so singular minded on on making something i find that you know you start to you know like you kind of keep your head down a little too long and there's other lessons to be learned. And so bringing in something like that, like Malbec, I brought in some Viognier this year as well, Mm -hmm. which is a really interesting thing because I did a co-ferment on that with Syrah, but then I also made some on its own. Uh, I've been making Riesling the last two years as well and and just trying new things. And what's really neat about all of that is that you find that not only does it teach you, A, how to make better versions of those wines from year to year, but it also informs like, hey, maybe if I tried this with Pinot Noir, what would happen? Or if, you know, just trying to kind of remain, you know, like quick on your feet, I guess, is is not feel like, okay, I'm going to dig my heels and this is like the house style of Pinot or this is like, this is what we do. And, and I think that it's important just from a learning, you know, standpoint, because every year I learn so much with this, um, to, to keep diversifying and bringing in new stuff. So yeah, this no. is, you know, this is an example of that, you know, and I hope that I could keep making wines like this, that, that show, you know, the learning process, um, but also just kind of show, you know, the fun that this place, it's, it's founded on curiosity and, and my, my girlfriend and my friends make fun of me because I, you know, I, I say earnest curiosity is kind of the tagline for this place. Right. Um, but it, it is, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that like, of course, you know, I have stuff in the building. Like sometimes I'll look at a barrel and I'll be like, what the hell did I put in that barrel? Why did I do it? Cause I felt it in that moment. And then right. I taste it. And I'm like, Oh, that's so rad. Like it worked out really cool in that, in that scenario. But it's, it's important to have those moments and to just be like, so curious just to see, you know, how we can keep leveling up everything that comes out of this place. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, and that's one of the reasons why I, you know, I follow you and have bought your wine yeah, because yeah. they are, uh, I am always intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> always. Thanks. Thank you. Um, all right. So we talked about, you know, you drove out to Sonoma, you know, you spent some time in yeah. Sonoma and, you know, you ended up coming up to, to Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and one of the places that you were at while you were, you know, in Oregon was at Rex Hill. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you did a couple, you know, a little blog post for Rex Hill. And, yeah. You know, oh, wow. You went to the archives, AJ. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, um, you know, which, which one of the things that you wrote was, on those brisk evenings, I resort back to winter mode and crave something hearty. Currently daydreaming about roasted chicken with some rosemary fingerling potatoes and a kale and cannellini bean. Ooh, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, cost guess to round it out okay so my i i think i'm just perpetually hungry is what we're kind of figuring out it could be yeah i I think this was like talking about (laughs) yeah uh, thanksgiving and what to pair with it yeah was this um was this for the jacob hart pinot noir that i was pairing with i think so okay yeah. yeah that's a that's a really cool wine and it's um you know the reason i came to oregon in the first place was it is still probably the shortest chapter in any wine textbook that you pick up. And, you know, that's, that's a disservice to this place, but I think that, you know, the secret's out at this point, you know, it's, it's, I I hope this doesn't sound like fighting words, but I I feel like to, to remain like naive about Oregon feels like you're almost being obtuse in the wine world. Like it's Mm -hmm. just, this is a place that has gotten so much attention and recognition internationally. Um, And, you know, the wines here are, are, there are some truly exceptional wines being made in Willamette. And, and, you know, I hope that I can, you know, continue as a producer to put my wines on those same shelves, but it's really cool to see the things that people are doing out here and, and, and seeing the recognition happening, you know, across oceans at this point. Um, but you know, when I came up here, I was working at a place in California that was really, um, I think a special place. The, the, the owner and winemaker there, his name is Morgan Twain Peterson. He um, has a winery called Bedrock down there. And what's really neat about uh, him and that place is that, you know, he is, um, he's an MW, a master of wine, very, very smart individual. He knows his stuff and he grew up in it. I mean, his dad started Ravenswood back in the 70s. And, you know, he has access to some of the oldest vines in the country, you know, wow. throughout California. Yeah, right. And so I feel like, you know, working there, I got this amazing history lesson. There was so much information available, which I love. But, you know, again, my curiosity was like, why is it that there's that short chapter on Oregon? I got to go see this place. I got to go see this place. And so I came up here and after harvest and before I left, I put my name in for an apartment. It was just, it felt like, 
the Wild West. It felt like, you know, there was, you know, what I loved about it was that you go into a place like Beaufrere and you're going to see, you know, Mike Etzel or Grant at the time, you know, right. making the wine and they're going to come over and they're going to talk to you while they still are wearing their muck boots because they're in the middle of it. But right. the degree of separation between the the producers and just people who were curious about the wines was, there, there was no separation. You know, you were just like, you're in it. You're in people's living rooms tasting with them or you're... You know, you go taste with people who've been doing this forever and they're still just like salt of the earth going to answer any question you have. And and it's right. what, you know, I think makes this place, the fabric of this place so special. Um, I landed at Rex Hill because I walked into that tasting room. I moved up to Oregon, no job. It was after harvest. So, you know, everybody had already auditioned whoever they were going to hire for three months during harvest. So I was like, well, you know, couldn't have picked a worse <laughs> time. But, you know, I made it a point to go out and taste. And, and what was so cool is that, you know, I went into Rex Hill I met a woman who was from the East Coast originally. We kind of hit it off and we started talking and it felt like our sensibilities around wine and our journeys were pretty similar. And, you know, shortly after that, I managed to uh, get a job working in the tasting room there. And um, I loved being there when I was because there were still, I mean, it's this beautiful new place now. They've done all this development. There's a new taste room and, right. and all that. But what was so neat about it was that, you know, for the Willamette Valley, despite being, you know, a relatively young wine growing region that was a place that was kind of one of the pioneers out here you know they were back in like the mid 70s i think were when they were really kind of getting their their footing and you know that's shortly after you know the irie stuff and and erath and all that but you know they had access to some of the older vines that were out here still and jacob hart you know is a site that's very special to them obviously but you know they were working with some really cool things and and what i found was that you know their model like most models out here was kind of emulating Burgundy. It was, you know, single varietal, single, you know, hillside or vineyard, uh, sometimes like single clone bottlings of things. Right. And it was their way of saying, hey, we make Pinot Noir, we make Chardonnay, and these are the, you know, we're trying to make a lot of different expressions of that. And I think what was so cool about that is, as like that point in my career was, hey, this is such valuable meta metadata basically you know you're getting to see singular snapshots of a place and really get to learn what terroir looks like and you know they've since kind of expanded you know obviously a to z and all that but they work with you know single vineyard expressions from i would say most of if not all of the sub avas around the valley so that's like so valuable as just like a a person who wants to learn about the region but my sensibilities around it were like well i think this wine is really great and i think that wine's really great but like could we make an even better wine if we blended those together you know and that's where the the blending identity of this place you know gets to do that but because i don't feel that like need or pressure to single vineyard designate a wine it's like i get to work with some really amazing fruit from lots of different sites um and inevitably i mean maybe every once in a while it all ends up being from one site but for the most part there's usually components that all contribute something right. but that energy and those sensibilities were really kind of amplified when i felt like i went to a place that kind of was doing that, I think, to an exceptional level, and that was Antiquatera. Um, you know, going into that building and seeing that, you know, Maggie's uh, emphasis on, you know, not making a wine because it had to be made, but more of like, what's the most beautiful thing, as she, you know, puts it. And right. and so, you know, to taste that way and to see those sensibilities kind of confirmed in real life and to taste those wines was really special. And it felt like this really kind of beautiful opportunity for me to see and unpack the ideas that I was kind of building on my own and see them done at a level like that, which is really special. But, you know, there's some kind of, you know, other stops between those, but but that's kind of largely like coming to this place and seeing not only how special it was, but then seeing people making really beautiful expressions of that stuff as well is is kind of what's informed a lot of, you know, the behavior in this in this cellar in general. Yeah, so. yeah. No, your journey has definitely taken you in, onto different paths. Yeah. And it is uh, having that curiosity and, you know, and also that, that time in Antica Terra. Yeah. You know, because you know, there's some there's some weird stuff that happens there. At times. Yeah, there are some interesting things. I've uh, I've been driven, I've been driving by it, you know, with some regularity lately. Just heading up to Dundee, and and I love that uh, all the lights outside are green right now, which is very funny to me. I, it's a, just a place that has a level of mysticism to it. That's really great. But um, very special people and very special place. And I've made you know, fortunately, some lifelong friends because of that place as well, which is really um, 
you know, again, makes the human element of it even more special than just, you know, the wines. But, yeah, most yeah. definitely. Should we try the next wine? Sure. Yeah. All right. I'm like, you know, trying to be very careful not to digress too far off oh, of no, the no. Uh, the questions that you're asking, but you oh. can't help yourself when you've That's been lucky enough to, to work in some great spots and, and just enjoy the last uh, 10 or 11 years out here now. Yeah, no, and, you know, and this is just a conversation. So, yeah. I mean, just, uh, you know, conversations in general have nice little tangents. For sure. So we're going to move into 100% Syrah from the Rocks District. Okay. Um, this wine is, um, I think, really starting to come into its own. I, what, something that I've, I've kind of realized, you know, as being a small producer, is that obviously you have to release the wines and keep the lights on. I mean, it's just the way it works around here. But what's really beautiful is, is that seeing these wines kind of develop, uh, you know, I'm starting to now build in, you know, my own increased cellaring time so I can start to release things really when I feel like they're starting to hit their stride. Right. But, you know, that takes you a couple years. You know, the first three years or so of, of making this thing, I really, you know, I sold every bottle, you know, just because you have to. Right. And now it's like every year I try to hold a little more back and a little more back, just not only for my own continued just education and having a library to pull from, but, you know, it's, I think it's going to be really cool in the future to be like, hey, here's a five-year vertical of this. Or here's, mm -hmm. you know, I think those are important things and elements to show you. They just feel more special that way. They're educational, but I think there's some really fun enjoyment in them as well. Um, but this is all from the Rocks. And I first learned about the Rocks uh, District back in 2015. They did a big presentation at the Oregon Wine Symposium. So my understanding at the time was that it was the most researched AVA in the country. And I'm sure it's been surpassed, at least in, in some capacity at this point, because the level of kind of like land surveying and all that stuff continues to just get more and more involved. But what's so exceptional about this region is that I think it's still like baby stages. I mean, there's the, the you know, sky's the limit when it comes to, I think, this region. But um, there's really very little topsoil. That's why it's called the Rocks District. It's just it's fields of like cobblestones of rocks, right? right? Yep. And so because of that, you're you're retaining all this warmth from the day because it keeps those vines warmer throughout the night. You can really kind of just ripen, you know, bigger reds out that way. Syrah, Cabernet, that kind of stuff, Merlot. Um, so I've been working with it since 21. So this is the third year now that I've made... 21, 22. Yeah. So this is the third year now that I've made Syrah from out there that's currently in, in barrel. Um, but the name of the game with this is trying to kind of like, again, just for, for my own style and, and the ways that I like to think about, you know, my sensibilities around Syrah is that I like to look to, you know, Northern Rhone expressions. I think they're very pretty, you know, when they're blended with Viognier or, or if they're done in a way where it exhibits more of that, like, pepper or spice and, and violet floral elements versus kind of the more meaty savory expressions of it. Right. And so this region wants to just like hit the weight room. It is like, you know, the gun show basically. And so trying to mitigate that means, you know, kind of limiting skin maceration periods, picking things a little fresher, you know, what you age it in, you know, stem inclusion or not, you know, I tend to de-stem a lot of the Syrah. Uh, and so I just, again, I'm looking for that elegance from that region that wants to give you so much kind of commanding power. And so I've made just about 130 cases uh, per year the last couple of years of this, just as a really special little kind of nod to like, hey, I, I think Syrah works really beautifully up here. Again, you know, we're not just the Willamette Valley. It's it's a state that is doing some exceptional things. You know, Southern Oregon, the you know, Columbia River Gorge. You know, you look at guys like Graham at Buonanotte doing some really fun stuff with Italian varietals or Nate uh, from Hayu out there and Syncline and, and Core and all these really great producers doing some fun things. So I think it's it's poised to really become another fantastic growing region that, you know, kind of gets that same same pedigree i i agree and <clears throat> i had a couple months ago i had a syrah and the winemaker was telling me i get hints of bacon yeah and i'm like i've never heard syrah have like hints of bacon yeah and sure enough yeah i'm like there's bacon uh so i mean i'm always amazed yeah. by what syrah can bring to the table and and show and I've had your Syrah before, and I've adored it, and I love it. And Thank you. And seeing it today, yeah. Um, again, you we find that constant note, that constant theme mm -hmm. of an elegance and just 
bringing it all together to bring a nice little nuance yeah. that is is that is really nice. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's um it's a it's an interesting varietal to work with. And again, I think, you know, sometimes I look at stuff like that and I'm like, well, you know, I love that you know, the Pinot Noir sensibilities kind of work their way into that, you know, and, and it's, it's a two way street, you know, in the same way that like working with that and seeing how it informs the other things, as I was kind of talking about it before, you know, this was, uh, this is, you know, kind of like that same, same style. And there are, there are people, you know, I obviously made Syrah down in California. I made some while I was at Antigua Terra for the Lillian projects that were there. Right. Um, you know, there was even some Syrah being made at Rex Hill for the Francis Tannehill label that they had from Southern Oregon. Right. So, you know, there is Syrah abound. I mean, you know, I know that Josh makes them for Bergstrom with the gargantua stuff, and it exists here in the valley as well. Um, but seeing the rocks kind of come into its own has been a really fun thing. And, and I count it as a privilege to be someone who gets to work with that stuff and just kind of build some diversity in the cellar. So, yeah, no, yeah. It, it is a gorgeous wine. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce the the other wine that ha, that has the the peacock on it is Pium. Is that how Pume? You, Pume. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No, it's all good. Oh. It's, you'd be surprised. Most of my distributors have um, called it Plume instead of Pium, oh. and it's why I've actually changed the name um, on the sequel to that wine, the Brezza. Here, it's Italian for breeze. Um, but plume for me for some reason just makes me think of a fart, and so I had to, I had to change the name. And so I was like, I'm not, I'm gonna make it as easy as possible. There we are with body parts again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> can't escape them. Yes. Um, and I love the story behind you creating the label on this. Yeah. Right. Uh, you described it as you know it's the label art is massive in real life. It is. Yeah. Uh, and it was something that uh, you worked with your mom over yeah. on like the a week of the of the holidays. Yeah, it's true. I uh, you know I attribute a lot of my creativity to just my upbringing. My mom is a very creative person, you know, and that stems from just like she'll send me, you know, label inspo all the time. She has a few minutes at work. She just cuts a couple things out. And she's like, hey, I thought this looked really cool, you know. And right. I've they've been pushing a uh, a pug label on me because I have a pug uh, <laughs> for the last couple of years, and I'm like, I don't know if the world's ready for that one yet, but. Um, you know, they've been, my mom's been, you know, so integral in my own creative path in life. I mean, I love to write, you know, I love reading. It's, it's why I got into being a book editor. It's because my mom and I would read all the time together. You know, we would paint all the time. My childhood bedroom, I'll never forget. I must've been, you know, four or five at the time. And my mom basically took the the uh what are the the roller pans like for um painting like the right, you right, know yeah. and she set them out and they were all the primary colors and you know she was like okay dip your hands and just start putting handprints on the walls and oh, so wow. we had a really cool like she had done a mural i remember she painted like winnie the pooh and um you know peter pan and all these characters from my childhood on the walls herself by hand and then she wow. we had one wall that was just our handprints in every different color and, you know, it's stuff like that that I'll remember forever, but it's why, you know, like, it's so cool that at 35 I go home and I pour, you know, two big Negronis at a Christmas table and my mom and I will cut car construction paper out, you know, and that's, <laughs> it's such a cool thing to have that type of relationship, you know, with a parent and, and also someone who just continues to kind of foster that creativity. And she's right. doing the same thing, you know, I have a sister who's much younger um, and she does the same thing with her and it just feels like, it's so cool to see, you know, the creativity that comes from, from family and in all different ways. My dad's that way, he's very creative, but with cooking. Right. You know, and, and, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to do these, these labels, but the Pume label is truly massive and it's, you know, I, I, Gave my parents the, as a thank you, my, my mom loves the Pinot, and um, I gave her the, the original Pinot label framed a couple years ago for Christmas, just as a, you know, thank you, and hey, I love you, all that kind of stuff, but um, the the Pume label, I would like to get framed at some point, but it's going to have to be a, a kind of a wall piece in my house, so. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> so, yeah. being a, a technology person, yeah, I'm curious, what is the process to get it from, like, your construction paper cutouts yeah. to digital. Yeah, well, it's um, it's funny. The Pume label and the original Gamay label were really the only two labels that I had done in those colors. So that was all, like, you know, with so many different layers of the peacock feathers and all that. Right. It was just layers of all different colors. Um, 
whereas a lot of the other labels I've done in black and white, and that's just for higher contrast. So ultimately all I do is I have these, you know, paper collages and I'll take a photo of them. And then what I'll do is convert the photo to digital. And then a lot of times I'll go in and I'll just digitally color everything so that I could change. And I'm by no means an expert with Photoshop. I would say that I'm, I'm like, you know, pretty uh, rudimentary at that. I know how to save a file, basically. Right. Um, so I go in and I color every pixel. It's very tedious. Yes. Um, and there's probably a much faster way to do it. Uh, but that's just kind of the process that I know. And in a pinch, it's, it's you know, gotten right. me this far. Um, but yeah, it's basically taking a photo, importing it into Photoshop, and then just with the little paintbrush going in and zooming in and trying to get as, you know, sharp of a line as I can. And then from there, I export it as a, as a you know, file and send it over to my printer and, and they, you know, kind of print it and that's that. Well, that's, that's yeah. cool that you go, yeah. that you yourself take it from physical to digital to label. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it's something that, you know, I really, I mean, I wanted to own every part of this process. And, and you know, I have a lot of farming input, obviously. I work with growers now for, for you know, longstanding relationships. And that's great. And so you really get kind of the, you know, you get to own that part of the process. Obviously, owning a vineyard is a little cost prohibitive at this stage. But, right. you know, getting to work with places the same blocks year after year and getting to know your sites is, is great. And, and that's like, I'm lucky to work with such fantastic people. But really, I wanted it to be something that, like, the full kind of connection of from grapes to ultimately what's in the bottle and what's in your glass feel like a creative expression coming from me and so it's it's why i've been very um you know reluctant to hand over any part of this to anyone else and you know i'd love to be able to collaborate on you know labels and that kind of stuff in the future just knowing that there's so many talented artists out there in the world and hopefully as i continue to grow this thing you know that's that's an upgraded problem to have is hey it's so busy i'd love for another artist to take on some right. but to me this is so personal and, and every one of these has such a personal story to the label or the story behind it you know and we could talk a little bit about the chardonnay um next but you know for the syrah it's a little bit of this kind of secret garden motif of like hey there is still prettiness behind this big brooding door that we anticipate as you know i thought of like a big wrought iron fence that was kind of overgrown and kind of scary you know as kind of a gate keeping thing with Syrah sometimes and I think behind that there can be really beautiful light you know levity and so that's what the sparks of color are um but everything you know it's it's so funny I I was working with um a friend down the hall here um they have this really beautiful kind of just like simple white background for photographing uh products for their website and she was kind enough to offer to take photos of of the lineup of things the other day and so you know rarely do i get to put all the bottles on display and at this point you know in making wine for the last seven years i mean you're looking at probably close to 40 different wines all with different labels and so it was really cool to see like just that array of color and thematically like there's always again like you know kind of the beige background is kind of across the board but just seeing the evolution of you know my color preferences or or all that stuff is is so fascinating and it's really just like fun and pretty like i was i was so stoked to see everything together at one time yeah it was it was cool that is cool so that is very cool so we move on to the chardonnay sure yeah happy to i'll give you a little rinse here as well all right thank you the funny thing about the Chardonnay label is that um, in doing this, you know, in being in, in this industry for as long as I have, I've never met anyone who's had more of a kind of, I don't know, like an acronym than, than someone who's not a Chardonnay drinker. They, I've met people who said, I'm an ABC drinker, anything but Chardonnay. <laughs> and I always think it's funny to meet people like that in a tasting when you're like, well, you paid the tasting fee. Like, you might as well just try it and then dump it out if you want. Right. Um, it's it's not economical to skip a wine, um, no. but you know I I think that Chardonnay is a really interesting varietal because it is I think and you might have heard me say this before is it's not the first time I'll, I'll use this but I think it's the best storyteller varietal. It really shows you 
you know, where it's coming from. It shows you, you know, the decisions you make, how hard you press it. It shows you what you age it in. I mean, it's, it's got this level of transparency, unlike other varietals that I think makes it kind of like you ask a lot of winemakers their go-to. And I think Chardonnay kind of inevitably comes up as like a varietal that you're like, it's just one that's going to be so uniquely different in the hands of whoever created it or where it's coming from. Right. And so for me, you know, with Chardonnay, I think, you know, the Willamette Valley has rightfully so been so synonymous with Pinot Noir, but I'm, I'm loving the fact that we're getting to see this region become associated with Chardonnay. It's, it's such a special varietal here. It's handled in such a unique and different way than other places. And with a level of just like, you know, kind of respect for the varietal and showcasing what it can do here that I think allows us to start to tell a little bit of a different story than Pinot Noir or other things. Um, this is all from a single hillside in the Chehalem Mountains. Um, it is aged in that 500 liter barrel right there. That was the nice. first brand new barrel that I ever bought for Pray Tell. And uh, this was aged for 18 months in that barrel. And then it was aged for an additional six months in stainless steel. The beauty of working with something like this is that it kind of kicks your ass in the process too. <laughs> um, I press everything in that basket press over there, which I realize the cameras are all pointing away from, but it is a very simple rudimentary kind of Italian basket press that is stainless steel. Um, it's fantastic for red wines, it's super, super gentle. It basically just feels like everything is free run out of there. So you're not, you know, breaking seeds or pushing too hard on skins or you're gonna get any bitter, you know, extraction or phenolics. With whole berry, you know, non-macerated white grapes like Chardonnay, putting them in there is an absolute nightmare because it means that you have to get in and out and keep foot treading it, you know, try, otherwise you're gonna leave a lot of liquid on the table because you just can't press hard enough. Right. Whereas, you know, obviously a bladder press in these scenarios, you could rotate the bladder press, you know, it could press a lot harder because it's got this pneumatic airbag inside of there. Um, but, you know, those things are, uh, are you know, minimum forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, or not a year, uh, <laughs> right. you know, to, to buy one of those. Right. So, you know, for me, what I ended up doing, I've been pressing Chardonnay and other white varietals in there now. I've been playing around with some more skin contacts and maceration periods that just help with the yields. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've learned in 2020, I made two different Chardonnays, um, kind of these bookends to see what that decision-making process looks like. And so this was all direct press, whereas its counterpart was uh, skin contact Chardonnay. And what I found in doing skin contact on the Chardonnay was it's not a particularly phenolic grape varietal the way that Pinot Gris is. You know, it's like, I have Pinot Gris in tank right here that looks like a full-on red wine. And it's really amazing to see the pigmentation, but also just the tannin profile on a wine like that can be yeah. really coarse. Yes. Chardonnay, there's a very steep cliff. So I found that after about 48 hours, the difference between things that were left on the skin, I did a 48 hour lot and I did a seven day lot. The difference in terms of tannin profile was pretty negligible at that point. So I decided to press it after that and just kind of see, okay, it's a little more golden hue just from a little bit of skin pigmentation working its way in. Had a little more richness on the palate, but really like it didn't feel like it went off the rails. I thought it was a really beautiful wine, but I, it made me not fear skin contact on Chardonnay, so to speak. Um, this here took about eight hours in a press. Um, I don't use any pre-programmed press cycles or anything like that. And I pressed it in a bladder press the same way I would a basket press. So I didn't rotate it. I didn't want to get any bitter extraction. Right. And so, you know, I had friends who were kind enough to let me use their press that, uh, that day. And I know I, I kind of, um, you know, kind of hogged the press at eight hours in there, but um, I think it ultimately yielded a really beautiful wine. This is something that um, I did a lot of barrel uh, lees stirring just to try to build richness, but I think there's this really lovely um, kind of freshness of acidity in there as well and kind of creaminess to it that, that makes for something. But the label, uh, back to the ABC thing and, and uh, you know, kind of preconceived notions about Chardonnay is that I wanted people to feel like it was an open door. You know, it's an invitation to try something that is hopefully going to change your mind if you've already got things working against your enjoyment of Chardonnay or at least open things up to, to you know, trying something different. So, yeah, again, you know, a little storytelling with everything in the labels. But, um, yeah. Yeah, no, the storytelling is, is always good, and I love it. The um, the Chardonnay, I think, is the, the first wine that I bought from you. Yeah. And I was trying to tell everybody about it. <laughs> i to try this. Thanks, yeah. And... Uh, 
you know, today I just had it just down here. I didn't yeah. even have my nose in, in the glass. And yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. I mean, I was just getting it just from there. It was, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. aromatic. Yes. It's a it's a cool wine. I'm, I'm quite proud of these, um, you know, the Chardonnay that has come out of the cellar. I, I will say I'm pretty exacting when it comes to Chardonnay, just in terms of what level I want it to be. Um, you know, I've made Chardonnay every year since 2018, but I've not released Chardonnay every year so i made it 18 19 20 um in 21 i used it in a in a blend that it worked really well in um 22 uh was kind of the same thing used it in a blend trying different sites out and then this year for the first time i feel really um like i've got a voice on on a skin contact chardonnay that i'm quite excited about in the cellar so far so it's just something that like i think about you know where when i put things out there i want them to feel special and and you know i know that there's you know more chardonnay in the world than than we can consume but i want you know the little bit that i do send out there to feel like um something different and something special so yeah yeah. most, most definitely yeah We'll have some rapid fire questions sure, for you. Let's do it. All right. Uh, your favorite artist to listen to during harvest? Ooh, um, depends on the time of the day. I would say in the morning, I like to listen to jazz. Uh, and usually, like, if it's a day that I really have to focus, I'll kick things off with um, uh, Miles Davis's Kind of Blue or maybe jump into some Coltrane. Uh, if it's a later part of the day, uh, I'll probably jump into. I mean, I'll look. The reality is, it's Hall and Oates. Hall and Oates is the answer to everything. There you go. All right. um, <laughs> but to dignify it, jazz in the morning, Hall and Oates the rest of the time. Nice. <laughs> uh, your favorite indulgent food? Ooh. Uh, well, I'm from a. You know, I'm from the sandwich town, so I would say. Um, I mean, I love a cheesesteak, as cliche as that is, or an Italian hoagie. Um, pizza. It's pizza. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just rapid fire. It's yeah, pizza. Yeah. Uh, if you could choose a superpower, um, I'm terrified of flying, but I feel like flying would be pretty cool. Um, just because you could get everywhere, and maybe it would, I'd be less fearful of it. Let's say flying. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, harvest notes are they digital or handwritten? Um, <laughs> it, that assumes that they exist, AJ. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> No, they are, are a, a mix of the two. I will say um, I, I had my girlfriend out here for Harvest this year, and it was fun because she was very diligent about taking notes. Uh, and so we have a winery notebook here, and she's she's kind of kept track of things. Or I'd be like, hey, would you mind writing this down? So she kind of keeps, uh, keeps me honest that way with notes. In the past, it's been, you know, the first year, I'll never forget, when I started Pray Tell in 2017, I had a notebook. I was fastidiously taking notes with every decision that I made or, like, a feeling I had around right. a barrel. Um, since then, it's kind of turned into, like, if it's written on a piece of scrap paper or on an, or on an iPhone note app, that feels good. Um, last year, I really didn't take any notes. It just was, like, shoot from the hip, and it felt... I didn't run any labs last year either, which was very fascinating. So I ran one chemistry panel. You know, typically you get fruit in, you know, you work with, there's a great uh, place in town called Coronology and they could run, you know, everything uh, and tell you the health of the fruit and the, you know, initial bricks and all that kind of stuff. I did that for one lot last year of Syrah because it was the first thing in. And after that, I was like, I just want to kind of, you know, feel the vibe of this vintage. And I truly did not run a lab until I was going to put things to bottle. And what was amazing about that was like, I felt this like real sense of connection to the, to the fermenters because I was just like putting my face in them every day and, and, you know, you're smelling and you're tasting constantly. And I felt this level of connection and I, it's like wild, but like I went and I looked at the the labs that I ran right before bottling because you have to know the ABV for the TTV and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was like, God, these like, they all kind of hit their mark and that was such a cool feeling i ran more labs this year um (laughs) but you know it was something that i think is a really you know to have that kind of snapshot of like hey this is and i do it because this year i work with some new sites and i want to know what what we're looking at here i need a baseline but you know it's cool to interact with things in a way and and I joke, but during harvest, like all of your senses feel heightened. And, and for some reason, my memory feels like it's like locked in. Like I remember certain days. I remember what I do on them. You know, it's that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, anyway, it's it's a long way of saying that it's I'm back to taking notes again because it's just, you know, made over 2000 cases this year of wine. It's hard so to keep I got to I got to take some notes. Head, yeah. I got to take notes. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Uh, last book you read. Uh, the last book I read was, I believe it was Tomorrow t- and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. 
Okay. Um, it's uh, it's a book about um, these folks who were video game designers, and there's kind of a love story wrapped in there and friendship and all that stuff too. Okay. That was I think that was the last book. Yeah, it's cute. Very nice. Yeah. Well, shall I reveal the the blind mind? Oh yeah, we gotta we gotta do that, huh? And then I'll get you out of here. Oh, I gotta stay. <laughs> oh well, you know you gotta what? get out. Of I here. gotta get out of here. Yes, yes. Well, it's a rosé. <laughs> we know that. Yes, it's a rosé. So, I mean, look, my, my inclination is to say that it's something that is uh, kind of uniquely tied to the philosophies around age-worthy rosés that are, you know, I kind of learned about and, and really started to explore in the cellar at Antica Terra. Angelical was um, something that I think you know, is, is really fascinating when it comes to skin contact time. Uh, the same lesson I think can be kind of observed as observed as well with, with Pinot Gris too. And just looking at the color of this, it is orange in nature, it feels like. Um, and so because of that, I'm kind of vacillating between, you know, an orange wine of, uh, of an origin I've not pegged yet, or of, of a lighter, kind of red like Pinot Noir as well. Okay. Um, age-worthy rosés to me, whether they're, you know, of, I'm going to take this fruit fly out of here. If they're of, um, you know, kind of showing you that, hey, it doesn't need to be, like the shelf life on this doesn't need to be so quick. You know, you can right. see some really beautiful development, whether it's, you know, even in orange wines kind of as well, seeing that there's there's longevity to them and they are so versatile and and kind of these complex creatures as they age too, which is, is really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to guess. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of leaving the door open to whatever you want to say whenever you're done. I'm, Will you give me a skosh more, if you don't mind, uh, sure. of, uh, like from kind of your sample bottle more. there? It's pretty tannic. Um, Do you like it? I do like it. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, I, is this something you've had before? Is it is something I've had before. And I will say the first time that I had it, it was January of 2020. And I was meeting with the winemaker. And uh, on the barrel was all the wines. And, you know, I think this was the first one that he, you know, th that he poured for me. And I says, I saw it come out of the bottle. I'm like, what in the heck is this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then he told me. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's neat. I think what's what's kind of cool about this is that there's kind of this like it it moves between like sweet and savory a little bit. You know, it's got kind of this. I mean, I feel like there's some difference in in kind of aging vessels here too, maybe. But the skin contact on it is such a lovely color, but the tannin profile is is, is pretty distinctive. Yes. I mean, I. I mean, look, I, my inclination just if we're feeling like we're going in the route of uh, wine made in Oregon from grapes out here, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I have some guesses, but I don't know if, if, uh, well, I mean, if I can call it. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's up to you. If you want to try to call it, you can try to call it. It's, it's, there is zero pressure. Whatever pressure you want to put on yourself, that's... Let's keep it zero pressure. Let's, zero let's, pressure. Let's do a reveal. So I think you should call this like a rosé of, of Gamay Noir just to get back at Andrew. There he is. Yeah. Is this a rosé of Gamay Noir? No, it's a rosé <laughs> of Pinot Noir. Um, I mean, the, the Antiquitera angelical sensibilities. I mean, obviously there's uh, a um, connection there. Um, Andrew's a fantastic winemaker. I mean, I think he's doing some really special stuff. Thank you for sharing this. I've actually maybe had one or two of the wines from, from this new project from them, and right. I've loved everything I've had. Very cool. Um, I'm glad he's, uh, I'm glad you got me with this one. Yeah. No, it, it is a good one, and they just came out with a, a new one this fall that I haven't had yet. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to hook up with Andrew and like, hey, I got I to gotta taste this. That's a cool wine. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Thank you. I appreciate your time today. Of course. Yeah, yeah. this is a lot of fun. You know, it's, I realized I probably went off uh, and digressed uh, on, on some of those no, answers, but it was, it was happy, all to, good. happy to share the story here. So yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got to do in the future. I want to, we get, you've got to do a role reversal. Somebody's got to interview you. We got to hear, hear the full story as well. Oh, yeah. maybe, maybe we'll have a panel of winemakers rapid fire oh, questions. Dang. Yeah. Why don't we do that in the future? <laughs> Oh, that would be interesting. That would be fun. And yeah, then they're like, all of them are going to bring like blind yeah, wines to yeah, for oh, we're retaliation. Put you on the spot. Yeah. yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's that's going to be the the next time we get together. We'll do that. Well, we'll, we can get together for other stuff between right. now and then, but we should do that. That would that would be fun. Cool, all AJ. Right. I appreciate your time. This is yeah. fun. Yeah. No, I thank you. Yeah. All right. Of course. Thanks. Already. Bye. Thank you for joining me on this flavorful voyage through the world of wine on the Wine Notes podcast. I've been your host and guide, AJ Weinzel, and it's been an absolute pleasure sharing these captivating stories with you. But alas, like the last sip of a fine vintage, our time together must end. But don't fret, my wine-loving friend. The cellar doors of the Wine Notes podcast will always remain open, waiting for you to return and explore new conversations, stories, and musings from the captivating people behind the magical world of wine. Before you go, Hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And don't forget to leave a sparkling five-star review to help spread the word. Until our glasses clink again, remember to savor life's moments and let the spirit of wine and camaraderie linger on your palate. Cheers, and as always, may your wine glass be full, your heart be light, and your journey be delightful.